Hi, I'm, uh, I'm George Eunice. I do not wear stockings. I don't know <laughs> if that makes me less cool than the last two people. Um, I'm uh, in charge of the STEMI and PCI programs here. And I'm going to talk a little bit about ACS and acute MI syndromes, particularly in women, and how that differs from the presentations we normally think about in men and some statistics and data in that regard, um, and a case presentation too. So uh, ACS affects 390,000 women a year. Uh, worldwide, outcomes in women are worse than they are in men. The mechanisms behind this disparity are kind of unclear, but it's been shown time and time again. Women are underrepresented in clinical trials, and I'll get to that a little bit later. And I want to start off with a case. This is, you know, when I started making this presentation a couple of weeks ago, I was trying to think of a case that I would present, and then this woman just showed up that day. And she's a 71-year-old African-American woman who I've known for many years, who has, uh, who's on dialysis, and she has hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, hypothyroidism, and a recent UTI, as well as a history of prior bypass, and a PCI with a stent in the Lima to LAD at the anastomosis, which was done at Ben Taub two years ago. She presented to the ER with nausea and vomiting all night long, abdominal pain, and her abdomen was painful and tender to palpation. During dialysis the day before, she had a little chest pain. Her blood pressure, blood pressure was uh, up in the 210s over 90s at that time. She had recently been evaluated in this hospital for atypical chest pain just uh, in February and had a normal stress test and normal echo. Like many of you may get texts with consults, this was the actual consult that I received. Called it into your office, ESRD, CAD, chest pain, and chronically elevated troponin. So I was like, okay, well, I told my fellow to go check it out. Let me know what's going on. So here's her labs. Uh, these are old from July, and this is when she came in. Here's her chronically elevated troponin, and it's a little higher. But, you know, a dialysis patient is hard to interpret what to make of that. The CK is a little higher, but it's not dramatic either. The MB is a little higher, but it's not dramatic. And she's denying any chest pain, saying she just has abdominal pain. Here's her EKG from August that was in our system. Really not much to speak of there. And here's the EKG at 2 a.m. when she hit the ER. She started to develop T-wave inversions, as you can see, uh, kind of uh, diffusely. This is at 6.53 in the morning. She's developing more pronounced T-wave inversions as well as ST changes. But she feels fine. You saw her enzymes. She just has abdominal tenderness, no chest pain. I mean, reproducible, you touch her abdomen, it hurts. So the broad differential diagnosis here includes ACS, malignant hypertension with elevated troponin from that, or chronically elevated troponin from vomiting, abdominal pain, and a dialysis patient. Who knows? So what do we do next? Cath, echo, just kind of watch her, cycle her enzymes. Um, just treat the abdominal pain and see what happens. I'll get back to her and tell you what happened. So um, different types of ACS uh, we're going to go through. And ACS, what does that exactly mean? It's any spectrum of pathological events that leads to ischemia or, or myocardial injury. So that, of course, includes STEMI, meaning complete thrombosis, which leads to myocardial necrosis. Non-STEMI, where there's partial thrombosis with myocardial necrosis. And unstable angina, where there's a partial of the occluded vessel, but there's not uh, objective necrosis yet, and then some overlaps and booms in between. Um, the presentation of coronary disease in women, as you well know, is often different than it is in men, and the media is aware of this and has been trying to uh, promote awareness of, of this issue. Um, and uh, you know, when you look at the, the medical facts, women are more likely to have unstable angina than they are STEMI. In Gusto 2B, STEMIs were shown in 37% of the men, only 27% of the women. And this was confirmed in the Get With the Guidelines Coronary Registry. Baseline risk factors in women. Women are generally older and sicker when they present with ACS compared with uh, their male counterparts. Um, again, in the same Gusto 2B trial, they, they had more diabetes, more hypertension, more CHF. And this has been confirmed in multiple studies in registries worldwide. Sicker, the definition of sicker here kind of varies by age. Younger women are more likely to have diabetes and CHF and stroke, but as women, as the patients age, women over 70, the uh, differences are less pronounced than they are in younger women. 
Diabetes, however, appears to impact women more than in, than in men. Uh, in one study, the Inner Heart study, looking at 27,000 patients, diabetic women were 4.3 times more likely to have an MI than women who do not have diabetes, whereas that risk was 2.7 in men. There is an elevated risk of coronary disease in female diabetics in multiple trials, and the reason for the discrepancy here is really unclear. Lifestyle factors play a role for everybody, but obesity seems to play a more common, a more pronounced role in women under 55 who present with acute coronary syndromes, but not so much in older women. Smoking as well, a stronger risk factor for MI in women than in men, and particularly in younger women where the relative risk is 7.1 versus 2.3 in men. Smoking is thought to be the biggest risk factor for coronary plaque erosion, which is a common mechanism of ACS that we'll get into, which is uh, different than plaque rupture, which is what we typically think of. In addition, there are psychosocial factors to be aware of. Depression. Among patients with MI, depression is more common in women than in men. And this is particularly more pronounced, again, in younger women under 55, who are twice as likely to have depression compared with younger men. Other comorbidities, including chronic kidney disease, are two times more frequent in women who present with STEMI, and that's associated with worse outcomes. Menopause is an important risk factor. With menopause, you have the loss of circulating endogenous estrogen, which is thought to have a protective mechanism, and the incidence of acute MI sharply rises in women after menopause. Um, however, exogenous estrogen replacement therapy, as we know, precipitates acute events. Oral contraceptives have long been associated with the risk of venous thromboembolic events. Uh, looking at whether that influences ACS, there's a 15-year uh, Danish cohort showed that the absolute risk of MI in women on o, uh, OCPs was rather low, but the relative risk increased with larger doses of estrogen while it was unaffected by progestin. This slide sort of summarizes a lot of the things that, that we've talked about included in terms of uh, issues specific to women in ACS. Um, age, depression, hypertension, smoking, diabetes, obesity, chronic kidney disease, all these are more common in women. And then there's other specific factors, pregnancy, which you've heard about um, today and I'll, I'll talk about a little bit as a risk factor for um, MI, particularly with uh, spontaneous coronary dissection, uh, menopause, and oral contraceptive therapy. So symptoms that women present with often a little different than with men. A review of nine studies showed that the absence of any chest pain was more common with women than in men. And men are, sorry, women are more likely to have upper back pain, neck pain, arm, jaw, dyspnea, weakness, and sense of dread. And again, this has you know, been made it into the media and particularly online. Women'sHealth.gov has a campaign to educate women on you know, don't miss your heart attack and be aware of the symptoms that, that may happen. And you know, facts such as women often seek long, you know, wait longer before seeking care in heart attack situations than men do. This is uh, from CMS, really, which is a campaign sh showing a lot of different uh, ads, really, or just, just pictorials on what a heart attack feels like to a woman. This one is chest pain, lightheadedness or sudden dizziness, shortness of breath. I like her facial expression on this one. Breaking out into a cold sweat, nausea, Left upper, or upper body pain, discomfort in one or both arms, back, shoulder, neck, jaw, and upper part of the stomach. Unusual fatigue. Pathophysiology, um, as I mentioned before, plaque erosion is, sometimes, is, uh, is seen more often in women than it is in men, as opposed to plaque rupture that we normally think, around, think about. On IBIS, plaque rupture may be observed in up to a third of women who have ACS and have no angiographic stenosis at, uh, at heart angiography. This is a result, uh, thought to be a result of endothelial dysfunction as well as leukocyte activation and inflammation. But the details of why this happens, particularly why more often in women, is not really clear. And there's been some postulation of being uh, related to coronary spasm, which we do know is more frequent in women. This is a little pictorial that just shows the same uh, sort of principles. You know, plaque rupture, there's a big lipid-laden core, which then has a lot of inflammatory cells, and there's rupture, and a thrombus forms that includes the whole lumen. There is no such lipid-laden core in this plaque here, where plaque erosion has occurred and a thrombus has formed that's at least partially including the lumen. 
you heard a little bit today about uh, spontaneous coronary dissection, so I won't belabor this, but it um, deserves a mention in this kind of a talk, where the layers of the, coron or the coronaries uh, spontaneously separate and intramural hematoma forms and compresses the true lumen and impairs anti-grade flow. 70% of reported cases of SCAD, as they call it, are in women. Um, this is what it looks like on angiography. This is what it looks like on OCT. Um, and is often associated with other diseases that affect arterial beds, such as fibromuscular dysplasia, lupus, connective tissue disorders, and of course is very uh, strongly associated with pregnancy. SCAD accounts for 11% of STEMIs in women and 9% of all ACS in females under age 50. So definitely to think about in young women with ACS. There's no randomized data on how to best manage these patients, stents, medical therapy, bypass, it, everything's been done. Um, mortality is one to five percent with postpartum women, or sorry, peripartum women having the worst prognosis. These are OCT images of the pathophysiologies I just mentioned, the plaque rupture, plaque erosion, and SCAD over here. Takasubu, I know um, Dr. Costello had talked about earlier today, stress-related cardiomyopathy, or also known as apical ballooning syndrome, which is often triggered by an acute emotional stress and the, a pronounced LV dysfunction, which is reversible. And that accounts for up to 3% of all ACS cases and is also more common in women, uh, and up to 6% of all ACS in postmenopausal women, and may take weeks to resolve or sometimes days. So evaluation and management of women presenting with acute coronary syndromes. If we look at the guidelines, you know, all it says is it's pretty much the same as for men. They should be managed with the same pharmacology as men and attention to weight or renal-based doses. I mean, it's all the same stuff. Women with high-risk features should have an early invasive strategy. Pregnant women, it's reasonable to pursue revascularization if an ischemia-guided strategy is ineffective for managing life-threatening complications in a pregnant woman. Um, so no real difference in terms of the guidelines. Diagnosis, troponin levels at ACS in women on average tend to be lower than they are in men. And probably partially from the, for that reason, the ACS diagnosis is missed more often in women than, it's, than it is in men. Women under 60 with ACS are given an admission diagnosis other than ACS more frequently than men. So it's totally missed when they come in frequently. Uh, there's these new higher sensitivity troponin assays that are coming out, which may allow us to detect MI much earlier than waiting four to six hours with our current troponin assays. And they, they may have gender cutoffs, which may help uh, improve detection of MI in women, particularly in the early hours. As I mentioned earlier, the women have a delay to present, in presentation for ACS compared with men. In the Cadillac trial, there was a 2.6 hour delay to presentation for men versus three hours for women since the onset of symptoms. I saw one study from Hong Kong where it was um, pretty marked, a 53 hour delay for women compared to 15 hours for men. It seems like everybody was delayed in that trial. Um, this delay, of course, may contribute to poor outcomes that are seen in, in women. And you know, there's many factors that may play a role here, including awareness, misinterpretation of symptoms, which may be atypical, uh, barriers to accessing care, fear of what may happen if they do go to the doctor or go seek care, and embarrassment for what they may be feeling. The medications in terms of treatment now and procedures that are used are similarly effective in men as they are in, in women. Uh, there's no sex-based differences that have really been detected at all in terms of effectiveness. But despite this, women tend to receive fewer evidence-based medications and be less likely to have invasive interventions than men are. Women are less likely to have PCI and heart cath at all. In STEMI patients, fewer women receive reperfusion with primary PCI or lytics compared with men, and this persisted after adjusting for other clinical factors. A dorsal needle time less than 30 minutes was only achieved in 28% of women, whereas 35% of men. And door to balloon less than 90 minutes in only 39% of women versus about 45% of men. Women also receive less aggressive medical therapies. Studies have shown there's less use of aspirin, 2B3A, thenopyridines, heparin, beta blockers, and even statins. The absolute differences are frequently small, but the trend was, is consistently seen. Um, the benefit, as I mentioned, for all these therapies, the oral therapies, is all the same as it is in men. Women do have a higher bleeding risk than men with ACS, and this may be from differences in body surface area and drug metabolism, pharmacokinetics, but there's no difference in efficacy. What about outcomes? Women uh, have increased bleeding and vascular access complications compared with men. Particularly, younger women have a much higher risk of vascular access complications compared to men. 
as well as higher in-hospital mortality post-PCI. Young women have twice, uh, a twofold greater risk of early death after MI, um, a higher risk of 30-day readmission, a higher two-year mortality. Women over 70, however, have improved survival and lower mortality than men do. Access site complications. This is a meta-analysis of a lot of trials which all show the same thing, which is that women have higher access site complications than men do, where the highest risk patients are the elderly, those with low BMI, chronic kidney disease, and congestive heart failure. An analysis of some big bleeding trials replaced to acuity and horizons. Uh, nearly 14,000 uh, women showed major bleeding in 7.6% of women versus 3.8% of men. So just being a woman increased your risk of bleeding by 80%. And women had a higher one-year mortality, 3.7 versus 2.7%. The use of bivalirudin rather than heparin reduced bleeding as well as mortality in the, in the women who were studied in these trials. No talk by me would be, in, be complete without a radial approach plug because this is something near and dear to my heart. Um, the radial approach may decrease bleeding risk in women. The SAFE PCI trial compared access sites in women only, and it was in elective patients as well as STEMI and non-STEMI patients. Now, in the study as a whole, they, they terminated it earlier because the overall risk of bleeding was rather small in all of the patients, and there was no difference in PCI access site complication rates, radial versus femoral. But there was a significant decrease in bleeding or vascular complications among all cats that were done in the radial or femoral approach. Um, in the rival trial, women were twice as likely to cross over to femoral, meaning they couldn't complete the case radially and had to switch to the groin approach. There was a higher incidence of encountering radial spasm. The rate of PCI was equally successful. Um, major vascular complications in general was higher in women, but was reduced in the radial approach, uh, where the number, needed, number of radials needed to treat uh, a complication in women was 33 versus 49 in men. If you look at data from the large national database, the NCDR, uh, the same trends are seen. Women are twice as, ri risk, uh, twice as much risk of having vascular complications with a diagnostic or a PCI. Uh, vascular complications are a strong predictor of MACE, including a 75% higher risk of death in MI and stroke. And by the same, uh, you know, as I said before, women were less likely to undergo radial procedures compared to men. Um, smaller arteries, smaller body size, increased tortuosity, those may all be factors. Bleeding post-PCI was higher in women than men. Using bleeding avoidance strategies uh, did reduce uh, the absolute risk of bleeding, and with the highest risk being in using radial and bivalirudin, and that produced the greatest reduction in bleeding risk in women. A word about women in clinical trials. Um, the FDA has been aware that the women are underrepresented in trials and have a campaign also, which you can find online, trying to recruit women to participate in clinical trials. Um, early major trials didn't really include many women at all, and there were not even any subgroup analyses by sex. So in the early 90s, the NIH and FDA had a mandate to include women in, in more trials. So if you try to look at how that worked, in the years before that, from 1966 to 1990, women were 20% of ACS trials, whereas after that, in 1991 to 2000, it was 25%. So I guess that's better, but it's not exactly representative because over that time period, women accounted for 43% of ACS patients um, who presented. So you know, despite these efforts, women are still underrepresented. And it's not really clear why. Um, in all of these mixed-sex trials, particularly with ACS, um, you know, maybe there's been postulation about concerns of safety for women of childbearing potential who are pregnant, et cetera, but that doesn't really explain the absence of older women in the trials. Um, people have pointed to general unwillingness of women to volunteer or higher tendency to withdraw, but that hasn't been seen in hypertension trials or in single sex trials. So it's not really clear what are the barriers to enrollment of women in these situations. So um, in summary, women and men present with sim similar symptoms in many cases, though at different rates. And women often have alternative mechanisms, such as SCAD, vasospasm, um, plaque erosion, in addition to plaque, plaque rupture that is usually seen in men. Women tend to receive less aggressive, invasive, and pharmacologic care than men, despite similar efficacy. Sex-related outcomes vary by age, and young women have a worse short and long-term outcomes than young men, but older women have similar outcomes to older men. And representation of women in clinical trials needs to increase in order to understand these sex-related differences. And so 
I think that the take home is we have to have kind of a heightened suspicion for ACS when women come in with atypical chest pain um, than we do in men because a lot of these patients are being missed. Um, so getting back to the initial patient that I had shown you, here's her next troponin. Uh, it's actually coming down from 1.66 to 1.24. Her CKs are not that exciting and her MBs a little higher, but again, nothing, nothing that dramatic. It's 4 o'clock now, and here's her EKG at this point. Remember, it you know, started out looking similar to this, but, but not quite as dramatically so. So again, what do we do? Heart cath, echo, just kind of watch her. Um, what I did was I, I ordered an echo, and you can see here that there is a, uh, I don't know if it projects well up there, as it does on my screen, but you know, the whole anterior wall and apex don't appear to be moving too well. The base is kind of hyperkinetic. Similarly on, on, on the uh, two-chamber view, you see similar findings. So this is another Takasubo case, which had a lot of confounders, because she's a coronary patient with prior bypass and stenting, and she's elderly on dialysis, and wasn't the typical patient you might think of for Takasubo. And um, here's the EKG the next morning. Her EKGs are just amazing. Um, I, I felt like I needed to catheter anyway, even though I was pretty certain of the diagnosis, because she does have a lima with a stent in it, and you know, this, I, it, you know, I thought it was probably the right thing to do. It, you know, I thought it was probably the right thing to do. So the first thing I did was an LV angiogram, and this is 48 hours after presentation, and she's already better. So that whole apical uh, stunning that was present 48 hours ago has already resolved. And her coronaries were fine. Um, this over here is the lima with the stent in it, the right coronary, and here you can see the stirrup circulation, and her coronaries were fine. So just sort of highlighting some of the issues we talked about. Thank you.